Good morning, everyone. It is Sunday, April 19th, and once again, I'm talking to you through my computer. Yeehaw! <laughs> Before we start, I want to encourage you to uh, check out our website and listen to some of the music that Jamie uh, Grigsby has played, that Sarah Delavorius has given to us, and Ruth Delavorius, and that they've put on the website. They've tried to offer that uh, as part of your worship service or as even part of your day. Uh, and so maybe before you want to listen to me, you can listen to that, or maybe after you listen to me, you can listen to that, or maybe instead of listening to me, you might listen to some of their work. But we've been trying to put it all together in one video, uh, but we need some uh, new technology to do that. So for now, I just have to direct you to the website, and uh, I hope you enjoy some of their music. I hope you all had a good Easter weekend last weekend. It was very hard not being together for the service and also not having brunch together and not having an egg hunt and not seeing everybody in their Easter clothes. And usually adults get all dressed up, as you know, and the little kids wear Easter clothes, little girls and Easter dresses and things like that. And uh, Lori said last week that we could have made a lot of money if we had designed a new line of Easter sweats for people to wear, or maybe Easter masks. I don't know. It, it's such a strange time. So many things have changed. We're shopping online. We're getting food delivered. We're preaching to the computer. And even television commercials have changed. They're still selling cars and potato chips and life insurance, but each commercial starts by talking about the virus and reminding us, like we need reminding, that these are stressful and unprecedented times. But I will say the only commercial that hasn't changed, but probably needs to, is the Frank Azar commercials. I'm, I'm waiting for the one where he says, if you need help with the virus, call me, the strong arm, you know, something like that. But yeah, in recent days, uh, everything has changed. I'm guessing you've probably heard people around you say, I've never seen anything like this before in my life. I know I've said that myself. It's like we're on the brink of something, but don't ask me what. Uncertainty seems to reign. What, what's going to happen to the virus? What's going to happen to the hospital system? What's going to happen with the stock market? And the biggest question, the one that we really don't say out loud but the one that we think about is, what's going to happen to me, right? Years ago, there was a Dutch experiment, and I doubt it would even be legal today. But there were researchers who told a group of people that they were going to receive 20 moderately strong electric shocks in a row. The researchers told a second group that they would also receive 20 shocks but only three of them would be strong. The other 17 would be very, very mild. They just didn't know when the stronger ones would come. Now, no one likes to be shocked, but it was the subjects who were in the second group that sweated more and experienced the faster heart rate. The groups that did not know when the strong shocks were coming, they were the ones that were the least comfortable. And that's right, isn't it? The uncertain future seems to leave us in the most discomfort. And even if you have good health and sufficient funds in the bank account and food in the fridge and clothes to wear, without certainty in our futures, we remain uncomfortable. And last week I talked about you about the certainty of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how the resurrection handles three really important areas of our lives, our pasts, our presents, and our futures. And in our passage today, we're going to jump back and take a look at a passage in the Old Testament, because uncertainty is as troubling 3,000 years ago as it is today in 2020. I invite you to read with me Deuteronomy 31 
1 through 8. And the situation here is that Moses is telling his people that he is dying and that they're going to have to go on without him. And their future looks very uncertain. So it's Deuteronomy 31, 1 through 8. Then the Lord went out and spoke these words to all Israel. I am now 120 years old, and I am no longer to lead you. The Lord has said to me, you shall not cross the Jordan. The Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. He will destroy these nations before you, and you will take possession of their land. Joshua also will cross over ahead of you, as the Lord said. And the Lord will do to them what he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, whom he destroyed along with their land. The Lord will deliver them to you, and you must do to them all that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for your Lord goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, be strong and courageous, for you must go with these, this people into the land that the Lord swore to their forefathers to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. That's our reading this morning. Now, the virus that has changed our lives is the size of one and a quarter nanometers. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. That might not help you. Think of it this way. If you can picture a human hair and you want to see how wide across is the thickness of that hair, the width of a human hair is about 100,000 nanometers. The virus that has changed our lives is only about one of those. And if that doesn't help, uh, you can scale it up. Think about uh, something being as tall as the Empire State Building. The virus, then a, a nanometer, would be less than the diameter of a dime. Okay. It's really, really tiny, and yet it's very traumatic. And for decades growing up, we have worried about a nuclear war. We've worried about an earthquake that's going to make California split off from the United States, huge tsunamis, things like that. But instead, it's this little tiny virus that looks like a pink soccer ball with spikes on it, that's the thing that's paralyzed the world. And it's the uncertainty about it that's our problem. Yeah, it causes a terrible respiratory disease, but we still don't really know how to handle it. We don't know what it can change into. We don't even know if it's coming or going. And even though Israel is not wrestling with COVID-19, they are clearly in the place of uncertainty. They are tired from 40 years of walking in the wilderness to this promised land. And Moses has just admitted what probably many suspected. He says, I'm 120 years old. I am no longer able to lead you. The Lord has said to me, you shall not cross the Jordan. Now imagine the collective gasp rising from the people. This is not a good time for you to step away. You can't go now. We're almost there. And we've already heard that we don't just need to cross the Jordan. We're going to have to take on some enemies. We're told there's some walled cities. There's some giants out there, that there are armies. We remember what they told us 40 years ago. 
there's a lot of uncertainty. And Moses doesn't want them to wait and remain fearful and troubled. So in front of everyone, he gives them the general plan. And in verse three and four, we read that Moses says, the Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. He will destroy the nations that you're facing. And Joshua will also cross over ahead of you and will basically be your leader. And the primary part of the story comes in verse 7 and 8. Moses charges his, his successor, Joshua, again in front of everyone and says, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be discouraged. And when I look at this, the first thing I see is a very clear call for courage. Now, let me bring you back a minute. Remember back in Deuteronomy 1, Moses sent Joshua and Caleb and others into this promised land to scout it out. And they came back saying, the land is amazing. We need to go take it. There are some problems. We're going to have to fight some folks and they're big. But because the people of Israel got fearful and then rebellious, God had them wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And at this point, they have not gone in yet. Now, fast forward 40 years. And here's Moses at 120 giving them the same words he received from God who gave them back in Deuteronomy 1. Don't be fearful, but take courage and do this. Many of the people who were alive back in Deuteronomy 1 have died, right? But, the, but Joshua and Caleb, for that matter, are still alive. Now, here's where this story resonated with me. I read some information that it's probably, you know, it's been 40 years since Joshua and Caleb first went out to spy out this promised land. And the, the researcher said Joshua was probably 59 to 60 years old. Caleb was probably around 85 years old. And if you read further about Caleb in the book of Joshua, Caleb is still testifying that this is something we got to do. He's still being strong and courageous. This is, this is what we are told to do. Now, when I thought about Joshua being maybe 59, that sort of resonates with me. And I, when I saw that, I had to physically stop writing this message and think about my own courage level at age 59. I know my courage level, my risk-taking level, has dropped since I was in my 20s. But it made me pray, Lord, I want to believe deeper in you as I grow older. The temptation to slip away from courage is everywhere. When you get older, you start to think, I don't know if I want to risk this. I mean, I got a wife, I've got kids, I have grandkids. I've got a home. I've got life insurance. You're telling me to just believe that God is going to come through this for me? That, that affects me when I'm 59. But then I read about Caleb maybe being 85, and he's still all in. I want our courage to grow as we get older. But, but think about it. God never says, be strong and courageous unless, of course, you're over the age of 40. Or be strong and courageous, but only if you're 100% sure that the outcome will be something that you can control or something that you can even understand. Now, in our current situation, please know, I am not saying that we should ignore or tune out the CDC. I'm not saying we should ignore the government and their recommendations. No, I'm saying we should be strong and courageous in all of it. It's like I said at Easter, it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
that should frame all of our thinking about these things. It should frame our thinking about everything. Be strong and courageous, not because we're so smart, but because we serve a great God. And over and over and over, we're told not to worry and not to fear in the Old and the New Testament. Verse 8 even gives us two reasons why we can be strong and courageous. Because it is the Lord who goes before you, and it is the Lord who will be with you. This is Yahweh, the covenantal name of God. Yahweh is a covenant-making and covenant-keeping God and is absolutely trustworthy. Look at these two statements. It's the Lord who goes before you. Not a committee, not a very spiritual, godly person, but God himself. When I look back on my life, I thank God for godly leaders and mentors and teachers that I've had. I thank God for godly parents, youth directors, pastors, teachers. I thank God for my friends who believed in Christ and neighbors and co-workers. But I also realize that there comes a time when those people are no longer there. I realize there comes a time when godly leaders like that have to go. Those people are given seasons in our lives, but they're, and they're very important to me and probably very important to you. <clears throat> but here, it's God himself, not a godly leader, who's bringing them in into this new land. Second, it says, it's the Lord who will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. This is such an important verse for us today. When we look around at all the things happening in the world, the medical problems, the politics, the financial realities, it's absolutely critical that we hold on to this knowledge that it is the Lord who is with us. It is the Lord who will not leave us or forsake us. Now, I know we're living in different times than the people of Israel in our passage, but this promise of God being with us and never forsaking us is as truthful and valid as in any time of history. Jesus promised at the end of Matthew, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. One of our Lord's names is Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Jesus promises to be with us and never forsake us or leave us. In John 11, Jesus says that he is the resurrection and the life. He says that he who believes in me will live, even though he dies. I don't think the Lord goes ahead of us to prepare the way and then sort of decides to pull out after that's done. When we are uncertain, we can rest in that God goes before us. When we are uncertain, we can rest in that God is present with us. I was reading a funny article from 2013 about a public zoo in one of the third largest provinces of China and how in 2013, it had to be closed down to an unusual problem. Visitors discovered that the zoo's lion was actually a dog posing as a lion. <laughs> According to a report in a Beijing newspaper, the fraud came to light when a mother and her young son visited the zoo and the animal that was labeled an African lion started barking. <laughs> the mom was outraged. Zookeepers admitted that the so-called lion was actually a Tibetan mastiff, a very large dog with a furry brown coat. And they also admitted that other zoo animals had also been mislabeled. Apparently, there was a white fox in a leopard's den and another dog being passed off as a wolf. The zoo even swapped out two snakes at the reptile house with two giant sea cucumbers. <laughs> now I'm not picking on China, and this could happen anywhere, but the picture in my mind of a lion 
that starts barking is pretty funny to me. And my point is no one wants a false assurance when they're seeking certainty. No one wants to be told that something is true when it isn't. And I know there's a very healthy sense of doubt and skepticism these days in anything we see or hear about this virus. It's very frustrating to me to hear something about the virus and then immediately think, I wonder if that's true, right? And we start basing our certainty on our opinions. That sounds right. I'll believe that. Or that's too pessimistic. Or that's too optimistic. And all that leaves us is, well, here's what I think. And because I think it, it must be true. And on Thursday of this week, I got to listen to a brief devotional talking about Luke 24. And it's the story about when Jesus had risen from the dead and has appeared in the presence of the disciples while they're hiding from the religious authorities. And Jesus comes to them and they're frightened and startled. And it says they, were, they thought they were looking at a ghost. And Jesus says to them, peace be with you. Why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. The certainty of Jesus rising from the dead is what we hang on to during these times. As I mentioned last week, it's the resurrection of Jesus that should frame everything that we're going through. It should be the thing that continues to give us courage and hope as we walk through this virus pandemic. It doesn't mean the virus isn't real or isn't dangerous. It just puts that in a larger perspective that God has gone ahead of us, that he is with us through this and through all things. It is certain. And as we grow together, and we are growing together through this, I want us to grow deeper in Christ. I want us to grow more hopeful and more certain of who God is and what God can do. Joshua had that at age 59. Caleb had it at age 85. I don't know how old you are, but our certainty in God, our certainty in Jesus Christ and what he did and who he is, that's what we stand on today. Friends, no matter how large this pandemic is, and no matter how long this pandemic lasts, let's be certain about who our God is. He has gone before us, and he is with us. He has kept his covenant and tells us not to be afraid or discouraged. The Lion of Judah, and I think we can be certain of this, the Lion of Judah is not a dog, but a lion. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for giving us your son and his death and resurrection and how that has changed everything for us. We pray that we would be more certain of who you are, even when we hear bad news or confusing news, that we would remember it is you alone that is certain in our lives. It is you alone who has promised us that you will go before us and that you will never leave us or forsake us. Lord, please help us to remember that this week. <clears throat> we pray for our first responders. We pray for the doctors and the nurses uh, who are trying to help people who are sick, for the people who are testing people to see if they're carrying a virus or not. We pray for our families, the people that we know who are sick and who are not. We pray for wisdom and common sense and good thinking 
as we walk through this. And then we mostly pray that we won't be afraid or that we will be courageous and that even whatever the news is, Lord, help us to remember who you are, that you are the Lion of Judah. You are not a dog dressed as a lion, but you're the real thing. You're the one that we can be certain of. I pray for courage and strength for all of the people listening today. I pray for their families, Lord, and I pray most of all that you will remind us each again and again how much you love us and how much you care for us. Give us strength this week, Lord, and guide us as we work to be your church in this community, in this neighborhood, in this world. We love you and we thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, have a good week. Hang in there, wash your hands, but be of courage because our Lord is certain. He loves us. Have a good week.